On the 30th of August, 1991, 2,000 maniacs piled into the Red Lion Inn in San Jose, California for Anime Con 91. While not the first anime convention to have been held in the U.S., anime-centric events had in fact been occurring irregularly throughout the country since the early 80s, Anime Con 91 was nevertheless a watershed moment in the history of American anime fandom. Earlier conventions, such as 1983's Yamato Con, were devoted to a single show, in that case, Space Battleship Yamato. Others, such as 1990's Project Akon, featured more anime programming than most other conventions of the day, but, as fandom pioneer Fred Patton argues in his book Watching Anime Reading Manga, the percentage of anime programming at the inaugural Akon was in line with a few other conventions like San Jose's Baycon, which were explicitly marketed as sci-fi or comic book conventions. What set Anime Con 91 apart, and what arguably makes it the ancestor of all subsequent anime conventions in the U.S., was the fact that it was devoted exclusively to anime, and it was the first to feature Japanese guests. Leiji Matsumoto, creator of Space Battleship Yamato and Captain Harlock, was to be the guest of honor, but unfortunately he had to cancel his appearance at the last minute. Despite this, the rest of the lineup was spectacular. Kenichi Sonoda, character designer for Bubblegum Crisis and the creator of Riding Bean, Joji Manabe, creator of Outlanders, Haruhiko Mikimoto, character designer for Macross. How is a first-year anime convention able to corral a guest lineup that rivals and even outclasses most anime conventions of today? The reason is that the con had a number of important sponsors. The organizers of Baycon, the pioneering anime translation outfit Studio Proteus, the official anime club of UC Berkeley, Cal Anime Alpha, and General Products USA, the American subsidiary of General Products, the legendary Japanese science fiction specialty shop and sister company to Studio Gainax. Using their U.S. arm to establish a foothold in American anime fandom, Gainax wound up becoming one of the most prominent organizers of AnimeCon 91. Not only was their presence invaluable in getting Japanese guests to San Jose, but the studio would also send a number of their own staff to the convention as well, including founder and co-president Toshio Okada, character designer Yoshiyuki Sadamoto, and director Hideaki Anno. This is going to sound insane, but because Anno was not as big a name as some of the others on the roster, his presence was not heavily advertised. Even today, websites that catalog information on anime conventions, such as AnimeCons.org, tend to exclude him from the guest list even though there are a number of reports proving that he was in attendance. It sounds insane in retrospect. An anime convention whose guest list is so stacked that Hideaki Anno, of all people, was not given priority of placement. Aside from this absolutely stellar guest lineup, the 2,000 fans who attended AnimeCon 91, some of whom came from as far away as Australia, had a myriad of other events to keep them occupied for the four days of the convention. Fan groups like Pine Salad Productions held room parties where they showed their parody films. There was a dub versus sub panel featuring literally the entire American anime industry in the same room. A masquerade was held where one of the skits used Kenichi Sonoda himself as a prop. And of course, since this was the early 90s and anime in America was largely inaccessible outside of conventions, there were anime viewings nonstop. Not only was the hotel TV system commandeered to show anime on several different channels, but a number of TV shows and movies were shown in viewing rooms. The most fascinating of these anime viewings was what was called the Super Secret Showing. The title was not announced in advance, and seems to have been advertised primarily by word of mouth to give it an additional aura of mystery. At 2.30am on Sunday, September 1st, a handful of fans crowded into one of the viewing rooms to catch a glimpse of this Super Secret Showing title. As it turns out, it was the world premiere of the first episode of Gainax's newest work, one that would introduce American fans to a heretofore unfamiliar word, otaku. In 1990, Gainax was hard at work on the TV series Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water. The series was a monumental critical and commercial success, finding favor among both hardcore fans and the general public, a first for the studio. In spite of this, Nadia was a complete disaster on the production level. 
The show's staff was completely unprepared for the rigors of a weekly television series. The sponsors maintained a heavy hand, depriving Gainax of the freedom they had been accustomed to on the wings of Oniamis and Gunbuster. And the studio was hit with a surprise extension of the show's episode count because of its runaway success. As a result of all this, Nadia's director, Hideaki Anno, chose to step away from the show due to burnout. However, he was unable to escape from the series for long, as shortly thereafter, the studio was commissioned by the show's primary sponsors, Toho, NHK, and Group TAC, to produce a Nadia movie. Initially, Anno refused to have any part in the project. His experience working on the TV series was so negative that the idea of creating more Nadia must have been the last thing he wanted to do. After discussing the movie with both Gainax co-president Toshio Okada and Group TAC head Asumi Tashiro, he changed his mind and agreed to return as director. Initially, production on the film progressed smoothly, with Gainax drafting an original story and Yoshiyuki Sadamoto designing a couple of new characters. But shortly thereafter, everything ground to a halt. Yasuhiro Takeda, in his account from the Nontenki memoirs, is mute about what exactly happened, but it seems obvious that Anno's mental health must have been the decisive factor. He was already debilitated from his work on the TV series, and though he agreed to direct the movie as a favor to his friends Okada and Tashiro, that toxic atmosphere must have continued to linger, and for his own sanity, stepping away for a final time must have felt like his only option. Anno's subsequent activity seems to speak truth to this. He would thereafter be diagnosed with major depression, and the depressive episode that began during the production of Nadia would end up lasting, by Anno's own admission, the greater part of four years. During this time, his creative output dropped to an almost complete standstill. In fact, aside from a couple of very minor exceptions consisting of key animation work for projects led by some of his friends, for instance, Shoichi Masuo's OVA adaptation of Crimson Wolf and Kunihiko Ikohara's directorial run on Sailor Moon, Anno would not return to the anime industry in any major capacity again until the year 1995. Even with Gainax's withdrawal, the Nadia movie still managed to release in June of 1991, this time under the auspices of director Sho Aono, with animation being handled primarily by South Korean studio Seiei. Apart from Sadamoto's new character designs and the initial story outline, Gainax was not involved in the final product, and it's debatable just how much, if any, of Gainax's original outline was retained, because, and there's no way to be kind about this, the movie is horrible. Some fans consider it to be worse than the infamous Island episodes. That's debatable, but it's certainly a close call. For starters, there's absolutely no reason for this movie to exist. The TV series ended about as conclusively as any story can. The only reason for it to continue would be from a purely business perspective. Nadia was a huge hit, and the sponsors saw an opportunity to capitalize on its success by making a sequel. And what did they choose to do with it? Simply put, the Nadia movie is basically the anime equivalent to The Force Awakens. Stop me if you've heard this one before. A number of mysterious disappearances are occurring throughout the world, and because this is the age of imperialism, all the great powers are paranoid that they're being sabotaged and the world is stifled by an aura of impending conflict. It turns out that the disappearances are the result of a clandestine group headed by a man named Geiger a survivor of Neo-Atlantis who's built an army of robots with the goal of starting a world war. This is just the TV series done much, much worse. The story is ludicrous, the animation is crap, and some of the characters are handled with absolutely no respect to the previous source material. I'm specifically referencing the Grandis Gang here, who we eventually find out have been hired by Geiger, thereby invalidating all of the positive character development they went through in the TV series for absolutely no reason. Honestly, even though I don't think this movie is as bad as that island arc, 90 minutes is way easier to sit through than 12 entire episodes, it makes me a lot angrier than those island episodes do. As bad as those are, I understand there were a number of unfortunate circumstances that led them to that state. The movie had no such excuse. Even without Gainax's direct involvement, the sponsors could have demanded something of higher quality, or better yet, just not made the movie at all. Unless you're a diehard Nadia completionist, or just have a particularly brutal masochistic streak, there's no reason for you to watch the Nadia movie. And even if you wanted to, there's currently no legal way to watch it in the United States. G-Kid's excellent Blu-ray set leaves it out, probably because they understand its reputation all too well. Subtitled rips of the movie can be found on YouTube, but life is far too short to waste even 90 minutes on something this poor. 
Outside of the movie, Gainax released two more pieces of Nadia media before leaving the series behind for good, and thankfully both of them are excellent. The first is Nadia Omake Theater, a series of ten comedic shorts meant for fans who have already watched the series in its entirety. Obviously, these shorts were just an excuse for Gainax to blow off some steam and tell some goofy jokes, and in that, they more than succeeded. Every one of these ten episodes is completely different from the other, and honestly, I'm super impressed with how consistently entertaining they all are. There's one that's basically Nadia's version of Gunbuster's science lessons, another is a propaganda film for Neo-Atlantis that draws heavily from movies like Triumph of the Will, another is a parody talk show. The entire thing can be watched in about 45 minutes, and it's worth every second, which makes it a tragedy that these shorts have never been released outside of Japan. In fact, even in Japan, they were released only as part of the TV series Laserdisc box set. Thankfully, there are fan translations, and I'll throw a link to a YouTube playlist where you can watch them all in the description of this video. The second project was the little-known series of compilation films collectively called Nadia, the Nautilus story. Basically, if the Nadia movie is the equivalent of The Force Awakens, the Nautilus story is the equivalent of the Gundam movie trilogy. All the filler of the TV series, including the entirety of the island episodes, have been cut out, leaving behind a streamlined story of the Nautilus's struggle with Neo-Atlantis. This compilation has languished in relative obscurity because, to the best of my knowledge, it was only ever released on Laserdisc in Japan in the early 90s. None of the previous American releases have included it, and for the longest time there weren't even any fan subs available. However, in June of 2023, a fan sub group called Kayaxi? Kayax? Forgive me for completely butchering the pronunciation of your name, released an English version of the Nautilus story, painstakingly reconstructed using the American Blu-ray release as their video source. This is a monumental achievement, and once again I'm going to leave a link to their blog in the video for anyone who wants to check it out. And with that, Nadia was finally finished. I'm sure Gainax was happy to finally rid themselves of this project that had caused them almost nothing but grief since its inception, but what was going on outside of Nadia was far from positive either. As a matter of fact, aside from their newly established games division finding runaway success with works like Princess Maker, just about everything else Gainax was doing in the early 90s turned out to be a colossal disappointment. Let's begin with general products. Gainax's sister company, creator of Japan's first sci-fi specialty store, instigator of the Garage Kit boom, and architect of the legendary Garage Kit vendor show Wonderfest. Any one of those accomplishments would be enough to secure a place in the annals of Japanese fandom history, and yet, by this time, General Products was in the lowest state it had been since its incorporation. For starters, the company had always specialized in garage kits. As I said before, their establishment was the instigator of the Japanese garage kit boom. But by the early 90s, General Products wasn't the only game in town anymore. Other manufacturers like Kyoto had formed and stolen some of their market share. In addition, a number of misguided plans to expand the company all wound up failing spectacularly. The first such plan was the establishment of General Products' editorial department, which was set up so they could enter the magazine publishing business. What was to become their first major publishing operation came from the head of Hiroshi Ueda, an employee who worked at their flagship retail store in Osaka. Ueda had always dreamed of being a magazine editor, and specifically dreamed of launching a magazine that specialized in Gundam manga. As luck would have it, Ueda had established some contacts at Bondi from his time in Osaka, and they were willing to go along with his idea. Thus, Cybercomic was launched. In theory, Cybercomic should have been a slam dunk for general products. Gundam was still massively popular at the time, and a magazine edited by a staff who were fellow Gundam fans just made sense. What doomed the project from the start was the fact that the magazine's staff were just not good at their jobs. Editors kept having to push back artist deadlines, and as a result, the magazine kept missing its release dates. Higher-ups at General Products attempted to reorganize the editorial staff to save Cybercomic, but by then it was too late. Bondi was so burned by the continual delays that they ended up pulling their support altogether. General Products attempted to keep the editorial department going, including launching a new anthology based on Yuichi Sasamoto's novel series Ariel, but it was for naught. The department closed up shop after just a couple of years, with almost nothing to show for themselves. This raises an important question. General Products had been astronomically successful at almost everything they had done up to this point, so how did they manage to drop the ball so spectacularly here? 
This is just my opinion, but General Product's previous successes had always been related to the talents they had carried over from their time organizing conventions and sci-fi clubs. For instance, the reason they were successful in creating character goods was because they had a number of gifted animators among their ranks. The reason they were so successful with their garage kits was because they had already crafted merchandise for the conventions they organized. And the reason why they were so successful establishing business relationships with license holders was because it was a natural outgrowth from the networking skills that had proven invaluable in establishing the Osaka Sci-Fi Confederation. Only when they decided to venture outside these comfort zones is when they ran into trouble. And this gets at a harsh but necessary truth to come to terms with. Gainax were not very good businessmen, and nothing demonstrates that better than the monumental failure that was their attempt at expanding into the United States. American anime fandom, in the late 80s and early 90s, was very different from anime fandom of the present day. For one, there was no such thing as the American anime industry. Though there was some anime shown on TV, or at least straight to VHS, virtually all of it was marketed to young children, with all evidence of its Japanese origins conveniently engineered out. That being the case, how did American fans discover anime in the first place? Most had come from sci-fi fandom, and had grown up watching shows like Battle of the Planets or Star Blazers on TV, and then, usually by a chance encounter at a sci-fi convention, they discovered the show they loved so much had come from Japan, and vowed to learn as much as they could about it. Usually this meant joining one of the nascent anime clubs that had sprung up across the country, such as the Cartoon Fantasy Organization, or, if they were really tech-savvy, log on to the early internet, specifically the rec.arts.anime newsgroup on Usenet. Because the effort necessary to even discover that anime existed was rather extensive, this meant that anime fans of the day tended to be the hardest of the hardcore. The kind of people who, when they gather the necessary funds to order the $120 untranslated laserdisc of Crystal Triangle from Japan, they would buy it without a second thought. So the idea of a company like General Products expanding to the US was a good one, made even better because Gainax had traveled to the country on a number of occasions throughout the decade. In the early 80s, they had traveled to Worldcon in Boston for inspiration for their upcoming DICON conventions. In the mid-80s, they had traveled to the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. for research on the wings of Oniamis. And once the film was finished, they traveled to Los Angeles for its world premiere, even if it was for the horrible StarQuest dub. In their travels, Gainax must have realized the insatiable demand of the small but dedicated fan community of the day. And so, in May of 1989, they incorporated General Products USA. Two fans were given the joint responsibility of running this new company. The first was Torin Smith, the Canadian-American superfan who, in 1986, sold all his worldly possessions and moved to Japan to start Studio Proteus, the first American company to professionally translate and release manga in the US. Smith had met the Gainax crew at the Daikon 5 convention in 1986, and over the years they became very close, such that they honored him by naming a major supporting character from Gunbuster, Noriko's first love, Smith Torin, after him directly. The second was Leah Hernandez, a big-name fan from the Dallas-Fort Worth area who had recently begun to work in the American comic book industry. The two of them entered General Products USA believing it was going to become an incredible success. As it turns out, nearly everything the company decided to do ended up a hilarious failure. These failures were evident from the very beginning. To obtain the initial round of goods for their American operation, Gainax decided to buy a bunch of merchandise from Animate, a major retailer of anime goods in Japan, and sell them at a markup. When Animate discovered what Gainax was attempting to do, they were, understandably, furious and refused to work with them going forward. Even before they had opened for business, they had already been blacklisted by what was supposed to be a major distributor. Afterwards, the failures just kept coming non-stop, and you know what? I'm just gonna list some of the most ridiculous things that happened, and you'll get the idea. Gainax just assumed that business tax law in the US was identical to what it was in Japan. Gainax tried to fax Hernandez at an apartment she hadn't lived in for over a month. Hernandez didn't receive a single piece of merchandise from Gainax until December of 1989, and even then it was just a stack of catalogs. None of the staff was ever paid on time, and the company was so short on funds that Gainax had to pay Hernandez's assistant Sean Howell in garage kits, and, most ridiculous of all, 
Gainax had taken so unbelievably long to ship anything to the US that other vendors had begun selling bootlegged versions of their own merchandise at conventions. That's right, bootleggers were selling General Products' own merchandise in America before General Products themselves could. This was the breaking point for Hernandez, who later described her time at General Products USA as basically consisting of waiting for faxes and crying. By 1991, she handed over the reins to Howell, but by then it was too late. The company would cease to exist by the end of the year. Aside from organizing AnimeCon 91, the entire existence of General Products USA was a colossal embarrassment for all involved. Further threatening the existence of General Products was the decision, at the beginning of 1992, to end Wonderfest. This decision had come from Gainax co-founder and head of the games division, Takami Akai. By this time, the studio had already created a number of successful original products, and Akai didn't think it would be wise to continue devoting so much time and energy to other companies' properties at the expense of their own. Okada agreed with him, and the decision was made for General Products to step away from Wonderfest. Despite this, Wonderfest did not end permanently. It was agreed that Kyoto, General Products' main competitor in the garage kit industry, would take over the event in their stead, and they continue to run it to this day. With the declining sales of their merchandise, multiple repeated failures to expand the business, and the end of their involvement in Wonderfest, there was no real reason for General Products to exist anymore. And at the end of 1992, the company was legally absorbed into Gainax. Though they had always been closely related, the two were now, from a legal standpoint, one and the same. And thus, General Products' 10 years of business came to an end. And unfortunately for Gainax, the end of General Products was far from the only problem facing the studio at that time. Gainax's contract when working on Nadia was such that the studio was receiving none of the series' residual successes. So, as they spent weeks upon weeks animating the show, the studio was hemorrhaging money. While the game division was doing a decent job keeping them afloat, the animation division also sought to try and reverse their fortunes. As such, Gainax began work on four short OVA projects with the goal of reclaiming some of the money lost from their work on Nadia, although in the end, none of the four ended up turning a profit. The first of these OVAs was called Circuit no Okami 2, Modena no Tsurugi. This was a 45-minute one-shot adaptation of the manga of the same name by Satoshi Ikazawa, the same artist responsible for Beat Shot, the golf story Gainax had previously animated in 1989. Much like Beat Shot, Circuit no Okami is another project that's never been translated into English, and thus I unfortunately cannot provide any additional commentary. The same can be said about Money Wars another 45-minute one-shot, this time based upon an original story written by Tomoya Miyashita. Though I personally can't provide any commentary on Money Wars, a short anecdote given by Takeda in the Nontenki memoirs gives some insight into its creation, specifically the problems in Gainax's ability to manage the project. Money Wars demonstrated that the issues Gainax had with the management of Cybercomic and General Products USA were not an anomaly, they were endemic to Gainax as a whole. The studio had, as is typical in the anime industry, commissioned an additional studio for animation assistance, in this case, Hyoin Entertainment. Gainax had been unable to keep Hyoin to their deadlines, and as a result, they were unable to complete the work assigned to them, forcing Gainax to finish the job themselves. When the rough draft was screened for Sony, the OVA's primary sponsor, it was apparently so rough that they told Gainax that there was no way they could release it in that state. And so, Gainax returned to the drawing board and worked on it at least two additional times, before finally just accepting that it was never going to get any better and releasing it as it is. Though Money Wars may have been an artistic failure, not all the OVA projects Gainax released during this time followed suit. The studio also released a couple that have gone down in history as unquestionable triumphs, the first being the two-episode adaptation of Blazing Transfer Student. Blazing Transfer Student began life in 1983 as a 12-volume manga series by Kazuhiko Shimamoto. Shimamoto already had a nearly decades-long relationship with Gainax before their adaptation of his manga, as he was actually a classmate of Hiroyuki Yamaga, Hideaki Anno, and Takami Akai at Osaka University of the Arts. If you're interested, he actually chronicled his experiences with the Gainax crew in a later manga called Blue Blazes, which was adapted into an 11-episode TV drama in 2014. 
I highly recommend it to anyone who loves good comedy or the history of Gainax, though it's worth keeping in mind that Shimamoto obviously crafted a highly exaggerated version of the story. Anyway, getting back to Blazing Transfer Student. The story is a simple one. A kid named Noboru Takazawa transfers to a school where every dispute, no matter how stupid, is settled through fighting, and as luck would have it, on his first day, Noboru gets tangled up with the class bully, Ibuki, in order to win the affection of their classmate, Yukari. Blazing Transfer Student reunites the dangerous tag team of Kazuhiko Nishijima and Yuji Moriyama, the main creative forces behind the legendary comedy film Project Eiko. That should tell you everything you need to know about the OVA. What Project Eiko was to sci-fi action anime, Blazing Transfer Student is to shonen fighting and sports anime. Even the look of the show is a clear pastiche of 70s sports shows, Ashita no Jo in particular. But even if you've never seen Ashita no Jo, that doesn't matter, as the focus of the show is more about sending up general cliches than shonen fighting and sports anime that anyone who's grown up watching stuff like Dragon Ball Z will recognize in an instant. There's the fact that what seems like the entire social structure of this show revolves around fighting, regardless of how absurd it is. There's the fact that every single character in the show is an insane, over-the-top caricature. The first person that Noboru encounters literally calls himself the Hall Monitor of God and leaves landmines outside the school to prevent truancy. And then there's the fact that every female character in the show, which in this case is just Yukari, is more or less reduced to a trophy. In Blazing Transfer Student's case, this is taken literally. But really, that's just a small sample. This is a show that features what feels like a million jokes a minute, and the incredible thing is that basically all of them are funny. What's more impressive is the fact that Gainax didn't let the focus on humor get in the way of the animation quality, as the show looks spectacular. The design work is stylish, and the fight scenes are impressive. Really, I can't think of anything negative to say about this show, which makes it all the more tragic that Blazing Transfer Student is another Gainax work that's never been officially released outside of Japan. Given the enduring popularity of Gainax's work worldwide, coupled with Project Eiko's decades-long status as a cult favorite, the absence of an English-language release of the title seems a strange oversight. Thankfully, fan subgrips of the Japanese Blu-ray can easily be found online. Their final OVA project is, in basically every conceivable way, the most interesting to discuss, and this begins with its genesis. Now, full disclosure, this story has, to my knowledge, only been told in one source, and that's Toshio Okada's legendary interview with Anamerica magazine from 1996. Given the fact that I've never heard it repeated anywhere else, Gainax themselves directly contradicted it in a commentary track, and that Okada has been known to exaggerate the truth, it probably didn't happen the way he tells it. Nevertheless, it's too good of a story to leave out, so I'm gonna tell it here. According to Okada, by the time Nadia was wrapping up, he had more or less created every kind of anime he had dreamed of, except for one. He wanted to make something about himself, so he sketched out a story with heavy autobiographical elements, and, just as he had done with Gunbuster a few years back, handed that sketch to Hiroyuki Yamaga, who would eventually work on turning it into a full screenplay. Yamaga assembled a team to work on the project in secret, and on July 1st, 1991, Okada's 33rd birthday, he was shown the final draft. Okada was over the moon with the results, and on September 27th, this secret project would be released as Otaku no Video. Otaku no Video is a deceptively deep subject. After all, it's a two-episode OVA that comes to a runtime of about 90 minutes. How much could there possibly be to talk about? Turns out, there's a ton. It was the first anime to explicitly feature other anime fans as its protagonists, giving birth to an entire subgenre in the process. Compared to almost all other OVA projects from around this time, Gainax seems to have put their all into this one. It's by far their most autobiographical work, and as such, their most personal. It gives, more than anything else they've ever done, the studio's definitive statement on what it means to be an otaku, and it's a beautiful counterpoint to the tiredly cynical responses that have come in its wake. And the fact that this positive philosophy of what it means to be an otaku came out when it did is a minor miracle in itself. To understand why this is the case, we need to go back in time about a decade, and discuss the emergence of the word otaku as it's currently used in contemporary Japan.
In Japanese, the word otaku is written with two kanji. The first, o, is an honorific prefix, while the second, taku, means house. So when taken together, the meaning of otaku literally means your house. But in practice, the word is an extremely formal way of saying the word you. As some of you may know, Japanese has a multitude of personal pronouns, with each varying based on the formality of the speaker and the seniority of the subject. And this is a huge deal in Japanese. It's not an exaggeration to say that using the wrong form of you is almost akin to, in English, calling someone an asshole. Anyway, some of you, while listening to spoken Japanese, have probably heard a lot of these different forms of you, like omae or anata, but probably not otaku, and there's a reason for that. It's very rarely used in contemporary Japan. The stereotype of the kind of person who uses otaku is an older middle-class housewife making small talk with her neighbors at afternoon tea, which obviously raises an important question. How did this obscure word for you that's used mostly with middle-class housewives come to refer to hardcore fans? At some point in the past, and nobody is exactly sure when or why this happened, fans began using otaku in conversation with other fans. There are a number of theories concerning the word's adoption, but among the most convincing comes from Japanese film critic Tomohiro Machiyama, who himself helped co-write one of the definitive books on otaku in Japan, conveniently titled The Book of Otaku. In Machiyama's opinion, the word otaku caught on among the Japanese fan community for two reasons. First, most anime fans may have found the word a bit more receptive to their sensibilities as opposed to the other forms of you which are perceived as more overtly masculine. Second, the housewives who most stereotypically used otaku before the fan community did so to keep somewhat of a distance between themselves. This may have appealed to otaku, who wanted to connect over shared interests without necessarily prying too deeply into anyone's personal lives. But whatever the case may be, otaku had become an accepted part of fan vernacular. For the first few years, it was something akin to a shibboleth. Only other fans were using it, and only other fans recognized it. This is not to say the usage of otaku didn't seep into more mainstream sources, because it did on occasion, the most noteworthy being the 1982 TV series Superdimensional Fortress Macross, where protagonist Hikaru Ichijo uses it a number of times. Otaku, helmet the notion that the word otaku would make its way into this phenomenally successful TV series is not as unusual as it may seem, considering the people who made it. After all, Macross's main creative staff were all drawn from the Japanese fan community, most notably in its creators, Studio Nue, but also in the men who would go on to form Studio Gainax, who Nue hired to assist them. Up until this point, otaku was exclusively being used in its traditional sense, as an archaic way of saying you. This would change in 1983, thanks to a column called Otaku Research in the magazine Manga Buriko, written by Akio Nakamori. In the debut edition of the column, Nakamori described the characteristics of the fans he saw attending Comic Hat. They're like those kids, every class has one, who never got enough exercise, who spent recess holed up in the classroom, lurking in the shadows, obsessing over a shogi board or whatever. The boys were all either skin and bones as if borderline malnourished, or squealing piggies with faces so chubby the arms of their silver-plated eyeglasses were in danger of disappearing into the sides of their brow. Now these unassuming classroom corner dwellers with their perpetually downcast expressions have come out of the woodwork and swelled their ranks into a really rather surprising 10,000 people. Man, it's enough to make your head explode. Historically, these kinds of people had been called maniacs, or morbidly, the gloomy tribe, but Nakamori argues these terms didn't adequately describe the kind of people he was talking about. Otaku, says Nakamori, was the better catch-all term. The fact that these young men were so fond of using this antiquated form of address better captured their disturbing eccentricities. Now, though his initial column did focus on the attendees of Comic Hat, Nakamori did go out of his way to emphasize that otaku came in many different varieties. There are guys who go around photographing trains, for instance, or worshipping at the feet of their favorite idol singer. This actually raises an important point. We in the West tend to associate the word otaku solely with anime fandom, but in Japan, one could be an otaku of basically anything. There has, nevertheless, always been a strong association between the word otaku and anime fandom in particular, and Nakamori arguably helped to form that association. The column was, after all, 
serialized in a manga magazine, and his subsequent entries hyper-focused on anime fans in particular, with episode 2 targeting fans of bishoujo characters, and episode 3 exposing the patrons of a popular otaku hangout in Shinjuku called Free Space. If you look at their style, the way they talk, and their character, it's clear that they'll never get women. Otaku definitively lack male skills, so they're content with carrying around pinups of anime characters like Minky Momo. They can't even talk to real women. Some viewers, using modern internet parlance, would categorize Nakamori as a troll. I prefer the much more accurate term of asshole. He's completely unpleasant and mean-spirited, barely able to keep his contempt in check. His writing is filled with dehumanizing metaphors, comparing otaku to slugs or leeches, and he seems obsessed with the fact that otaku don't live up to his arbitrary level of masculinity. His column is akin to someone having a two minutes hate about how handicapped people are so much more inferior to the able-bodied, and I'm not the only one who sees it that way. A contemporary reader of Manga Buriko had the same reaction. And, I mean, obviously. Again, this was printed in a manga magazine specializing in stories about bishoujo characters. Nakamori was shit-talking its readership to its face. It should come as a surprise to nobody that the column was singularly unpopular, and was cancelled by the end of the year. Despite its cancellation, this new term he coined, otaku, had been let loose, and a debate began in fandom concerning the word. Some, understandably, thought it was entirely discriminatory and should be avoided. Indeed, this was the stance taken by one of Manga Buriko's editors, manga author Eiji Otsuka, but others desired to reclaim the word and use it for themselves, similar to what American Star Trek fans did with the originally despairing nickname Trekkie. Obviously, this group won the day, as otaku has become the standard term to refer to any sort of hardcore fan. For a while, this was kind of the way things went. Any discussion of otaku was more or less confined to the otaku themselves. The general public would be blissfully ignorant of the term until the end of the decade, and they would discover it in what is perhaps the most horrifying way possible. On the afternoon of August 22nd, 1988, Mari Kono, a four-year-old girl from Iruma in Saitama Prefecture, left her home to visit a friend for a playdate. She never made it to her destination. Kono's father reported his daughter missing that evening, and police immediately began a massive manhunt for the little girl. Though their search came up empty, police did discover two potential clues. Witnesses had seen Kono with a pudgy man in his late 30s, and Kono's mother had received an anonymous postcard with a single haunting message written on it. There are devils about. The devils would strike again in early October. Masami Yoshizawa, a seven-year-old girl from Hano, also in Saitama Prefecture, was walking alone one afternoon, and, like Mari Kono, vanished without a trace. Police would again mount a search, but, also like Mari Kono, that search came up empty. Two months later, Erika Nanba, a four-year-old girl from Kawagoe, again in Saitama Prefecture, also mysteriously disappeared. Police mounted yet another search, but this time, they actually found something. Namba's clothes were found in the area surrounding the Naguri Youth Nature House, and the next day, Namba herself would be found, buried in the woods almost two hours away from her home in Kawagoe. Though investigators had been able to close the Erika Namba case, they came away with an even greater sense of dread. The Kono, Yoshizawa, and Namba cases were far too similar to be a coincidence. There was a serial killer on the loose in Saitama Prefecture. Further revelations would confirm the investigators' suspicions. All three families had been plagued with a recurring series of strange phone calls after the murders. Further, the Namba family, like the Kono family before them, had received an anonymous postcard. This one reading, Erika, cold, cough, throat, rest, death. The case would grow quiet until the following February, when Kono's father would find a mysterious box on his doorstep while on the way to work, and what he found inside was nothing short of horrifying. Contained within was dirt, ash, photographs of children's clothes, a set of human bones and teeth, and a note that simply read, Mari. Bones. Cremated. Investigate. Prove. The remains were immediately sent away to be examined, and while an initial dental examination proved inconclusive, it was eventually found, beyond all doubt, that both the bones and teeth had been those of Mari Kono. As horrible as this was, the Kono's nightmares were not over. Several days later, they received a letter from someone calling themselves Yuko Imada that essentially confessed to the murder of the little girl. 
Imada would send another letter the following month, where they would describe in detail Kono's corpse. By this point, Imada would be dubbed by police as the little girl murderer, but no new updates in the case would occur until June, when five-year-old Ayako Nomoto vanished from a park in Ariake, in Tokyo's Koto Ward. Police would discover no clues for this latest disappearance until five days later, when a mutilated torso was discovered in Miyazawa Ko Cemetery in Hano. An examination would immediately identify the torso as belonging to Nomoto. At this point, the citizens of Saitama, and now nearby Tokyo, were paralyzed with fear. The little girl murderer was completely evading police, and his crimes were only seeming to grow more disgusting. It seemed as though only a miracle could catch him. But finally, almost two months later, they would get their miracle. On the afternoon of July 23rd, 1989, two girls were approached by a strange man in a park in Hachioji in western Tokyo. He commanded the older girl to stay put, and led the younger to the bank of a nearby river. Obviously sensing something was wrong, the older girl ran to her father, who sprinted to the river to find the man taking naked pictures of his daughter. In a blind rage, the father pinned the man down, but he was able to escape his clutches and flee the scene of the crime. The police were called, but it seems as though they had lost their man until, completely illogically, the man returned to his car. Local police arrested him, charging him with forcing a minor to commit indecent acts. Despite this, they also believed that, at long last, they had finally caught the little girl murderer, a fact that was confirmed when he confessed a few days later. The man was Sutomu Miyazaki, a 26-year-old printer's assistant from Itsukaishi, also in western Tokyo. After his arrest, police would raid his house to gather more evidence, and what they found there was a scene straight out of hell itself. Miyazaki's room was filled with close to 6,000 videotapes. Some of these tapes not only confirmed that he was, in fact, the little girl murderer, but brought to light details of the crimes that were almost unthinkable in their brutality. Miyazaki did not just murder the little girls. He raped them, ate parts of their body, and had sex with their corpses, all of which he recorded and added to his mountainous VHS collection. Police were not just dealing with a serial killer, they were dealing with an absolute monster, a monster almost beyond compare in the annals of Japanese crime. The public was horrified by the details of his crimes, which was further spurred when newspapers printed the pictures taken of Miyazaki's room. And it was here, in response to these pictures, that a small number of readers noticed a particular detail. Miyazaki's tape collection was extensively filled with anime. Believing a witch hunt against their kind was inevitable. Several figures in anime fandom, including Eiji Otsuka, began publishing responses to the unfolding events, defending otaku against a figure they believed would cast the community in a negative light. The mainstream media really had not used the word otaku when discussing the case up to this point, but because of Otsuka and his ilk, they'd now been given a convenient new label to describe Miyazaki's kind. The tabloids were the quickest to adopt it. By sheer morbid coincidence, Summer Comicette had just begun, and one tabloid was quick to make the sensational assumption that the thousands of otaku who attended the convention was an army of Miyazaki's in training. Now, it probably doesn't need to be said, but the idea that anime was in any way responsible for Miyazaki's actions is complete bullshit. Clearly, this was a deeply disturbed young man in every respect. Nevertheless, the connection between the murders and the fact that Miyazaki was an otaku became inexorably linked, so much so that Miyazaki is commonly referred to in modern accounts not as the little girl murderer, but as the otaku murderer. It's almost impossible to overstate how damaging the Miyazaki murders were to the social status of otaku in Japan. Before, if anyone in Japan even knew what an otaku was, they probably just assumed you were talking about an awkward geek. But now the eyes of the entire nation were upon them, and many of them began to assume that it was only a matter of time before one of them became the next Miyazaki. Of course, the hysteria would die down, and one could say that the otaku's standing among the Japanese would come to be repainted in a brighter light. The international success anime and video games were to find in the late 90s, in the wake of the premiere of shows like Pokemon, would lead to the notion of cool Japan, an idea that both academics and the Japanese government would seize upon in the early 21st century. Meanwhile, the overwhelming success of Densha Otoko in the mid-2000s would go far in painting otaku in more human colors. Despite this, the otaku's increased social standing has always been built upon a shaky foundation. All it takes is one psychopath, 
for instance, Tomohiro Kato and his 2008 killing spree in the otaku mecha of Akihabara for the pendulum to swing back in the other direction. The argument can very easily be made that the moral panic started by Miyazaki's capture has, in some ways, continued unabated since 1989. It's in this atmosphere of fear and trepidation that Gainax's decision to create Otaku no Video must be examined. Logic would dictate that in 1991, only an idiot would create a work that openly embraced its otaku roots. After all, Miyazaki was still on trial, the wound was still very much a fresh one. Nevertheless, it's obvious that's exactly what they were trying to do. Remember the story of how Okada created Otaku no Video so that there could be an anime about himself? Even if it turns out that there's a grain of truth to that story, it would still be far from the complete picture. Other sources, including producer Kazuhiko Inomata, states that Gainax began the project in direct response to the Miyazaki murders, to return a sense of pride in otaku that had been lost in response to the incident. Yamaga himself, in Otaku no Video's Blu-ray commentary, seems to reinforce this. According to him, Okada brought him the Book of Otaku and told him to make an anime based on it, despite the fact that the Book of Otaku is a collection of essays. The book was written in the wake of Miyazaki's capture. The crimes must have been weighing heavily on Okada's mind, and it's obvious to see why. Gainax's entire brand was centered around their identity as otaku. They had begun in the ecosystem of the hardcore fan community in Osaka, and their major works were filled with references that only other otaku would understand. I'm sure he was the last one on Earth who wanted this negative stigma to continue. Thankfully, he was in the best position to do something about it. It must be emphasized again. Gainax was the group that had, in a matter of a few years, gone from a group of obsessive fans to helming the most expensive animated film in Japanese history, and who, a few years after that, would helm Nadia, which was arguably not just the most popular anime of the early 90s, but the most popular television program of the early 90s, period. If anyone was qualified to speak on the positive aspects of otaku culture, it was Gainax. So that's exactly what they set out to do. Create a work that would celebrate otaku while drawing heavily from their own history. And so, with all that context out of the way, we can begin our analysis of otaku no video itself. For a series with so much historical and cultural baggage behind it, Otaku no Video is, in actuality, relatively straightforward. The story centers on Kubo, who's pretty much the Japanese ideal of what a young adult should be. He's a student at a good university, he's a member of the tennis club, he's got a steady girlfriend named Yoshiko. Kubo seems set to take his place as a paragon of Japanese society when one night, after going out drinking with some friends, he has a chance encounter in an elevator with an old high school buddy of his named Tanaka. Kubo is excited to reconnect with Tanaka. From what little we see of them here, it appears the two of them had a genuinely good relationship in the past, but it doesn't take long before Kubo realizes something is amiss. Tanaka has a new group of friends, and these friends are all unmistakably otaku. This entire first part of the first episode is really effective on a narrative level. Gainax weren't stupid. They more than realized that, in 1991, most viewers were going to have a negative view of otaku, and so that's exactly what they give them. The very first scene, as a matter of fact, is a flash forward to the present day, where an obviously exasperated Kubo is having an obnoxious telephone call, which ends with the pointed exclamation, otakus are assholes, probably not too far off from what society as a whole thought of them at the time. The elevator scene continues to play into this expectation. Kohei Tanaka's choice of music here is a combination of goofy and unsettling, effectively painting the otaku as both impossible to take seriously and yet almost imbued with an aura of danger. Kubo literally can't escape from this claustrophobic situation, as Tanaka's friends continue to speak in references and in-jokes that Kubo can only read as absolute nonsense, it's hard not to feel that he's indeed found himself in a dangerous situation. This is all continued when he runs into them again at the school festival, only this time they're all in cosplay, which only serves to make him feel all the more unsettled. And yet, in the midst of all this, there are hints that this new group is not entirely what it seems. As I mentioned, Kubo and Tanaka seem to have a genuine connection, and the show makes it clear that there's an emptiness in Kubo's heart that his seemingly ideal life just isn't satisfying. 
Kubo's friends are basically all yuppies. They spend all their time talking about what luxury cars are the in thing this week, and standing in line for hours just to get some designer clothing, and Kubo could not be less interested in what they're talking about. If this were taking place in the 21st century, he'd be the one spending all his time looking at his phone, completely ignoring the conversation around him. His encounter with Tanaka, though tinged with this unsettling feeling of being surrounded by this army of otaku, is probably the closest thing Kubo's had to a positive social interaction thus far. Tanaka seems poised to be the one to guide Kubo to a more fulfilling life, and that's exactly what ends up happening. Tanaka invites Kubo to his place, a room that, to quote Kubo directly, suggests his life revolves completely around manga. This, I feel, has to be a reference to the infamous newspaper photo of Miyazaki's room. Though Tanaka's place is far neater, I don't believe anyone would have looked at this room full of stacks of anime paraphernalia without being reminded of the otaku murderer. But there's not really an unsettling aura here. As a matter of fact, when Tanaka suggests to Kubo that they go to another cool place, Kubo agrees without hesitation. They wind up at the headquarters of Tanaka's circle, another apartment even more filled to the brim with otaku merchandise, to say nothing of the other guys from the elevator. Admittedly, Kubo is initially filled with unease again, but it doesn't last long. He's properly introduced to the group, discovers how creative animation can be, and is given the opportunity to re-watch a favorite series from his youth from their library of VHS tapes, an opportunity that he graciously accepts. Soon, he's given a crash course in everything otaku from everyone in the circle, and with that, Kubo's transformation into a full-fledged otaku has begun. Now, this is admittedly a short scene, but I feel like there's so much to say about it that it's worth taking a pause and focusing on it in detail. First, I feel like the animation deserves a mention. Otaku no Video is, in a way, different from most of Gainax's past work, in that it's a story set in modern-day Tokyo, not some distant science fictional universe. Because of that, there's obviously no room here for any sci-fi spectacle that we've gotten used to from, say, Gunbuster or Nadia. But what Otaku no Video loses in spectacle, it gains in environmental detail. Gainax has so beautifully captured the look of the city that I'm inclined to believe that if I were to have been able to walk around Tokyo in the 80s and 90s, it would have looked identically to how Otaku no Video presents it. This incredible attention to detail is even more apparent in the domestic environments, with the Circle's headquarters being a fantastic example. What seems like every inch of their room is filled to the brim with some kind of merchandise, all of which is drawn from real life. Anime Ego, Otaku no Video's American licensor, has an amazing set of liner notes for the show, where they attempt to catalog every single reference, and they run on for pages and pages and pages, and what's amazing is that these are only the ones they've been able to find. For years, fans have been able to email them to inform them of their oversights, with those additions being incorporated later. As long and as detailed as the liner notes have become, I guarantee there are still references that nobody's been able to discover to this day, and I love that. Gainax did such a great job making this world feel authentic. Honestly, Otaku no Video's environments remind me so much of those from the Wings of Oniamis. The difference, of course, being that the Wings of Oniamis has triangular spoons, and Otaku no Video has Space Warrior Baldios model kits. Aside from this stunning attention to detail, I feel this scene in particular does a great job of setting up Gainax's philosophy of what it means to be an otaku, so I'm going to discuss that right now. The word otaku is, occasionally, compared to the English words nerd or geek. This is, in many ways, a false analogy, as otaku has so much socio-cultural baggage attached to it that it does not translate into either of its English equivalents. That being said, there is, in my eyes, one major parallel that sticks out. Nerd and geek are two words that more or less everyone uses, but nobody can come to a consensus on what exactly they mean. If you don't believe me, just read anything that attempts to define them. Say, for instance, Patrick Macias' introduction to his book Otaku in USA. Once you're done there, read something else that attempts to do the same thing. What is a nerd? What is a geek? What's the difference between a geek and a nerd? Everyone is going to have different answers to those questions. It's almost as if nerd and geek are less actual words than they are Rorschach tests that aid in clarifying what the writer in question believes about this group they're trying to define. Otaku is much the same way in that respect. Every writer will inevitably have their own definitions of what constitutes an otaku, some perhaps even comparing otaku to the older term maniac. Save for the common notion that otaku tend to be obsessive by nature, that's where the agreement ends. Like nerd and geek, the word tends to be another Rorschach test. 
And it's no surprise that this is the case. Otaku, nerd, geek, these things aren't naturally occurring. They're labels for social constructs that are entirely created by human beings. That being the case, we can use Otaku no Video as such a Rorschach test for how Gainax themselves defines Otaku. And as a definition, it's one of the most beautiful I've ever encountered. To me, there are three components necessary to being an otaku as Gainax defines it. The first is breadth of knowledge. Though otaku may be associated with having a singular obsession, it's not as though that obsession completely defines them. We can see that in Tanaka's circle. We've got someone who's obsessed with classic tokusatsu, another who's obsessed with pretty boys, someone else who's gung-ho about military stuff. But their fandom does not begin and end with those obsessions. The guy who's super into tokusatsu may have an encyclopedic knowledge of Ultraman, but he can still have an intelligent conversation about, say, Gundam or Dragon Quest. The second component is depth of knowledge. Being an otaku means you're obsessive by nature. If you love something, you're going to want to know as much as you can about it. It's almost a tautology. The third component is a creative drive. It isn't enough to just consume and accumulate, you want to create something, and it doesn't matter what that something is, to share with the fan community. Tanaka Circle has this in spades. They make stickers, they create dojinshi, they cosplay. I mean, hell, Tanaka says directly that their goal is to take over the industry someday. These three components are what defines otaku according to Otaku no Video. And as further proof that this is the case, they're also exactly what defines Gainax themselves as a studio. The typical description of Gainax, especially among Western fans, is that they're an anime studio made up of anime fans. This is technically true, but at the same time, it's not the complete picture. As we've seen from their previous output, Gainax is not only well versed in anime, but also in tokusatsu, literature, film. It's almost as though no area of fandom is off limits to them. They seemingly have more knowledge of their passions than anyone else on the planet, and, well, their creative output has been the subject of this entire series. So Otaku no Video is more than just an exploration of otaku. It's also an intensely personal self-reflection of Gainax's history up to this point. Indeed, specific references to Gainax are all over this work. To point out just a few of the most significant, Tanaka's character, both his physical appearance as well as his personality, is a clear portrait of Toshio Okada. Kubo himself is even drawn from real life, in this case the life of screenwriter Hiroyuki Yamaga. According to the Blu-ray's commentary track, just like Kubo, Yamaga wasn't at all knowledgeable of things otaku until he entered university, at which point he befriended Okada and Anno, they introduced him to their hobbies, and the rest is history. Even the specific shows the characters watch are, more often than not, connected to Gainax in some way. When the crew is watching anime with Kubo for the first time, the two things we see them watching are Daikon 4 and an episode of Macross, and one character even praises Anno by name when discussing the animation. This kind of ridiculous metatextual self-reference tends to backfire 99.9% .9 of the time. Anyone who's ever had the misfortune of sitting through M. Night Shyamalan's Lady in the Water knows how easy it is to fall into unwarranted self-congratulatory bullshit. Otaku no Video is the 0.01% that actually works, because, I mean, they made Daikon and Macross, they've earned the right to brag. So Kubo falls deeper and deeper into the otaku rabbit hole, and the rest of his life begins to change in tandem. His room, which looked nondescript at the beginning of the show, starts to resemble Tanaka's. He quits the tennis club, and spends more time with Tanaka and his group at Yoshiko's expense. Yoshiko, of course, fails to understand Kubo's new life, but Kubo's more than satisfied. It's clear that things have changed drastically in a very short time, which is further emphasized in the scene where the crew is waiting in line for a movie. Kubo and the gang are waiting for the premiere of Nausicaa, which, again, is another project that Anna was heavily involved in. As they wait, a drunk couple approaches them and asks what they're doing. Kubo has no shame in telling them they're waiting in line to see an anime movie. The man can't fathom why they would want to wait in line to see a cartoon, at which point Tanaka responds with a line that I'm sure every anime fan has probably thought about saying to somebody at some point, it's not a cartoon, it's animation. The situation from the episode's beginning has completely reversed itself. Kubo is no longer on the outside looking into something he can't possibly understand. He's now very much on the inside, and has no problem not only declaiming his otaku identity, but brushing off the drunk couple after they respond dismissively. The affirmation of his new identity is such that he even takes up Tanaka's suggestion to ask Yoshiko if she'd be willing to do a group cosplay with him, as Macross is Hikaru and Minmei. 
but to his horror, the next time he calls her, she breaks up with him, ostensibly for his weird new hobbies. On the one hand, I feel like deep down, Kubo probably saw this coming. After all, he'd been spending a lot less time with her, and she didn't exactly hide the fact that she didn't understand what he was doing. On the other hand, such a breakup was always going to be difficult, and indeed, the next time Tanaka sees Kubo, he's visibly upset. It's at this point that begins what I think is the most emotional moment of the entire series. Kubo essentially calls the bluff of not just Yoshiko, but of Japanese society in general. Why, he wonders, is it okay for someone to be obsessed with tennis, but not to be obsessed with tokusatsu? Why is it acceptable for someone to wait for ages in line to buy an expensive designer sweater, but not for a Miyazaki movie? Why is getting paid for doing a job you don't care about considered normal, but devoting untold hours to something you're passionate about without getting paid for it is considered weird? There are so many social hypocrisies concerning otaku, and Kubo is just tired of it. He understands now that there's no way, given all these hypocrisies, that he can possibly fit into normal society. And honestly, he doesn't even want to, so he decides not to even try. He's gonna go all in on being an otaku. He's gonna be the king of all otaku, the Ota King. Tanaka, of course, is seized by Kubo's passion, and the two of them agree to accomplish their dreams of being Ota Kings together. And with that, the first episode of Otaku no Video comes to a close, and I have to say, I absolutely loved that ending. For something that started by leaning so heavily into audience expectations, the end became an emotional expose of just how much those expectations are founded on complete bullshit. Anyone who's ever felt unfairly cast out for just being different for no reason can find something to latch onto here. But of course, those of you who have seen Otaku no Video before knows that there's something I'm forgetting. I've discussed Kubo and Tanaka's story, but there's an entire portion of the show that I've yet to mention once. And so with that, it's time to discuss Portrait of an Otaku. Portrait of an Otaku is a series of live-action mockumentary interviews interspersed throughout Otaku no Video. Drawn from an idea of producer Yoshimi Kanda, each of these 10 interviews focuses on a different type of otaku, and they run the gamut from a guy who used to make doujinshi in college, to a guy who obsessively tapes things to build the ultimate video collection, to a guy who plays war games, among many, many others. Unlike the animated segments, which tend to be a bit more over-the-top and exaggerated, these segments, as befitting the live-action medium, are much more reserved. That's not to say that no ridiculous stuff happens at all, because it definitely does. To state the most obvious, there's Mr. A, who builds a set of goggles to descramble the mosaics on pornography, and there's Yudai Ikta, a salaryman who hides a Shar Aznable helmet at his desk at work. But overall, these segments are much more sedate, lending credence to the idea that these are all actual people, even though in truth they're all completely scripted and acted by other members of Gainax. This obvious incongruity between the animated and live-action portions of the show leads to the obvious question of how these segments should be interpreted. The show itself does not tell us. It simply alternates between animation and live-action without giving comment. This, I feel, has tended to cause reviewers to view the animated and live-action segments as more polarized than they should be. I'll stick to a single example here. On an old episode of Anime World Order, the host of the Geek Nights podcast left a voicemail, at one point, they mentioned that Otaku no Video's dichotomy between the animated and live-action segments suggest what the otaku thought they were going to achieve and what they actually were, which is, and I quote, scary, 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 scary people. I never gave this response much thought when I first heard it, but going back and re-watching Otaku no Video for this episode made me realize their conclusion seems not just inaccurate, but profoundly mean-spirited in its implications. First of all, the ten interview subjects are so varied in character that it's hard to find a single word to unite them all, scary or otherwise. There are only a couple that I could see them finding genuinely, quote, scary, unquote, the first being the guy who's playing porn games in his room. From what he says, the fact that he doesn't typically leave his house and that he has trouble talking to real girls, we would probably classify him today as a hikikomori. But does that make him scary? I could get behind, say, admitting to not understanding how someone could live so differently than most people are used to, but does not being able to understand someone for being different than you or I by default make them scary? I pray that your answer to that question is an emphatic no. 
the only other person who, to me, could strike someone as, quote, scary, unquote, is the American otaku. And I actually want to talk about him in a bit more detail, because there's actually a lot more going on in his interview than the others. So, the guy in question is the seventh interview subject, an American expat living in Japan named <coughs> Sean Hernandez. Those of you who have been paying attention to this video will probably think that name sounds familiar. That's because Gainax named this character after Sean Howell and Leah Hernandez, the two heads of General Products USA that I discussed earlier. The actor playing Sean Hernandez is a guy named Craig York, who is actually Sean Howell's assistant during the sad final days of General Products USA. This interview is a bit different than the others, in that, being a native English speaker, York answered the interview questions in English, and Gainax translated his answers into Japanese. Someone who speaks English fluently thus has the opportunity to both listen to what York actually said, and see how Gainax translated his answers. And honestly, translation is too generous a description. Parts of it qualify as a full-scale rewrite. York's original answers were very sincere and heartfelt. The guy is a bona fide hardcore fan, and he's being nothing but earnest in his love for the medium of anime. Sean Hernandez, on the other hand, is a Christian missionary who loves Japan so much that he made it his dream to live there. Those of you who went to anime club in high school probably encountered someone who is so obsessed with Japan that they wish they could have been born Japanese. That's basically the kind of person Sean Hernandez is, and I mean that literally. He actually asked why he couldn't have been born in Japan at the very end of his interview. The interview itself actually proved to be quite controversial. Leia Hernandez admitted that when she saw what Gainax did to York's answers, she felt disgusted, and for that reason has never been able to enjoy Otakuno video as much as most other American fans have. On the one hand, I can understand where she's coming from. Gainax did take York's heartfelt responses and transform them into a joke. That being said, in Gainax's defense, I really don't think they were trying to mock what he was saying in any way. They were just trying to paint a goofy picture for their little project, and York was just a means to that end. Anyway, getting back on track. This obsessive Japanophilia could come across as scary, but again, is it really? I've certainly encountered these kinds of people at Anime Club, just as most of you probably have. These people are obnoxious, perhaps, but scary is taking it a bit far. And let me just say, I gotta give Sean Hernandez some credit. That annoying Japanophile at Anime Club's knowledge of Japanese culture probably began and ended with watching illegal rips of the English dub of Naruto on YouTube. Sean Hernandez is actually living in Japan. He's living the dream. You gotta respect that. So if they're not scary, scary people like the Geek Knights guys said they were, how are we to read these interviews? In the Blu-ray commentary track, Yamaga calls the difference between the animated and live-action segments a juxtaposition between the creative and the obsessive. Kubo, Tanaka, and the rest of their crew are the creative. They're in a circle, they're always making things, they're going to take over the industry, as Tanaka said. The live-action segments are the obsessive. They spend all their time with their hobby of choice, which in most cases means some form of consumption. This feels correct, but I think there's more that can be added. To that end, I want to take a page from Dark Horse manga editor Carl Horn and suggest that this juxtaposition can be made more sensible if we compare it to what Gainax did in The Wings of Oniamis. When I analyzed The Wings of Oniamis, I did so by using the paradigm of a dichotomy between the sacred and the profane, with protagonist Shiro emblematizing the profane, and his girlfriend Rikini being a paradigm of the sacred. Despite this, I argued that this dichotomy is not as rigid as it may initially seem. Shiro, most obviously, contains a spark of the sacred hidden beneath his surface-level profanity. Otaku no Video seems to be a parallel, though there may be a dichotomy between, as Yamaga calls it, the creative and the obsessive, there is always a spark of the creative hidden beneath the obsessive, and vice versa. In the animated segments, Tanaka's circle may spend most of their time with their creative endeavors like cosplay and making doujinshi, but we shouldn't forget that they spend a not insignificant amount of time waiting in line at movie premieres in order to get limited edition merchandise. Likewise, there are vestiges of the creative all over the obsessive live-action interviews. Mr. A's porn descrambling goggles may be goofy, but it requires a degree of technical proficiency that most people just don't have. Similarly, there's Hiroshi Sato, the guy who's crazy about building garage kits. Just the sheer act of building a garage kit takes an insane amount of craftsmanship. And as someone who can barely paint a high-grade Gundam model without making a fool of himself, I have an infinite amount of respect for anyone who has the skill to craft a garage kit. Just as it's impossible to completely segregate the sacred from the profane, 
so too can you not completely segregate the creative and the obsessive. The important thing, as Gynax seems to suggest, is making sure the creative remains the dominant force, and Otaku no Video is a powerful statement and argument of the dominance of the creative. With all that being said, I feel as though we are ready to move on to episode 2. Episode 2 is, admittedly, the weaker of the two episodes. This mostly comes down to its focus. The episode is mostly a business-themed story charting Kubo and Tanaka's meteoric successes in establishing their Ota kingdom here on Earth. And honestly, I find Episode 1's examination of Kubo's gradual acceptance of his otakudom a more compelling and moving story. This is not to say that Episode 2 is bad. On the contrary, it's so ridiculously over the top that it's impossible to not enjoy it. Most of it is a fever dream caliber roller coaster ride of Kubo and Tanaka's Garage Kid Empire, and obviously, just from that description, you can tell that once again Gainax is drawing from their personal history. The Garage Kid company they establish is called Grand Prix, abbreviated to GP, which, of course, is a clear shout out to General Products. Much like General Products, GP manages to conquer the Japanese Garage Kit market, albeit in a way slightly exaggerated from reality. I don't think garage kits were ever a major talking point on Japanese morning news shows, but is this really that big of an exaggeration? Honestly, the most realistic part of this entire episode, for me, was the scene in the conference room, as that would seem to suggest Gynax are much more comfortable in a business setting than we know they are. But you know, this is in part a fairy tale, and I'm willing to grant them this fantasy. Really, there's only one portion of the episode that deviates from this fever dream story of success. And it doesn't even last long when compared to the episode's total runtime. GP's chairman of the board, a scumbag bank manager, successfully conspires to manipulate the rest of the board against Kubo to remove him as president and install his wife in his place. And, just to twist the knife in the wound that much deeper, his wife turns out to be Yoshiko, Kubo's old girlfriend. As a result, Kubo is exiled to head a small branch office in Kichijoji. This is the context of the flash-forward scene from the first episode, and yeah, it's easy to see why Kubo would be frustrated given the circumstances. But this is quickly resolved when Kubo and Tanaka, through their sheer passion, manage to patch things up and start an entirely new company, one that focuses not on garage kits, but on OVAs, or as they call them here, garage videos. This new company is christened Giant X, which, I mean, just say that name quickly. Giant X, Gynax. Anyway, together with an artist friend from their GP days, Fukuhara, Giant X creates an anime that combines a compelling story with a character design that's easily marketable. The character in question being Misty May, Otaku no Video's mascot, and arguably the greatest work of character designer Kenichi Sonoda, which, given his imposing resume, is no faint praise. Not only does Giant X eventually come to purchase GP, but achieve a level of success that would rank them among the most successful businesses in Japan. Their anime gets premiered to a sold-out crowd at the Tokyo Dome. They play a not insignificant role in Japanese international relations, with James Baker and Mikhail Gorbachev taking note of their success, and most notably, they accomplish their ultimate goal of opening Otaku Land, an otaku-centric theme park in the city of Uroyasu in Chiba Prefecture, which for those of you who don't know, is the location of Tokyo Disneyland. The episode's final scene is one that, even for Otaku no Video, feels ridiculous. Decades and decades into the future, an elderly Kubo and Tanaka enter the ruins of Otaku Land. They take the elevator upwards, which leads to what appears to be the bridge of the Yamato from Space Battleship Yamato, with its seats filled with their friends, all as young as they were in 1982. Kubo and Tanaka remove their helmets to find that they, too, have aged down to their 1982 selves. Afterwards, Otaku Land takes flight into orbit, with its crew embarking on a new mission, to otakunize the rest of the universe. Perhaps this is just me being weird, but I've always interpreted this scene as symbolizing Kubo and Tanaka's dying and passing on to some sort of afterlife. The fact that they're both old men, the surreal fact that the inside of Otaku Land is the bridge of the Yamato populated by the younger versions of their friends, the fact that Otaku Land is really a spaceship, this all feels like what Kubo and Tanaka's ideal version of heaven would be like, being able to continue their otaku activities with their friends and to otakunize the final frontier just as they were able to do on Earth. If the legendary Greek lawgiver Solon was correct in asserting you cannot count a man happy until he is dead, then we must conclude that Kubo and Tanaka were among the happiest men who ever lived. 
but that's just a theory. A game theory! Anyway, however this scene is meant to be read, it certainly feels a perfect way to cap off a story of Otaku Triumph. As you can tell, I love Otaku no Video. Yeah, it's not perfect. The second episode isn't quite as good as the first, and sometimes the pacing can feel a bit breakneck to fit the story into two episodes, but those criticisms are so minor compared to how much it does right that it's almost irrelevant. Otaku no Video is such an uplifting, positive portrayal of the potential of fan creativity and accomplishment that it's almost impossible to watch and not feel a sense of pride. The kind of fan that Otaku no Video portrays is the kind of fan that I've always aspired to be, ever since I first saw the show back in high school. That all being said, one question remains. What exactly is Otaku no Video's legacy? The answer, like everything else about this show, is more complicated than it seems. Most directly, Toshio Okada co-opted the term Ota King as his own personal nickname, which he uses to this day. Additionally, the show more or less created the genre of anime about anime fans. The subsequent shows as varied as Excel Saga, Genshiken, Comic Party, Shirobako, and countless others owe their creation to the trail Otaku no Video blazed in the early 90s. That in itself is a powerful legacy, but this betrays the sad truth that, from a commercial standpoint, Otaku no Video was not successful in Japan. Gainax has been open about the fact that none of their OVA projects made to recoup the cost of Nadia, regardless of their quality, were commercially successful. To really drive this point home, it should be pointed out that Otaku no Video is the first Gainax anime I've analyzed for this series that did not rank at all in the Anime Age Grand Prix. It would appear that not even Otaku wanted to watch anime about Otaku in 1991. Though this may suggest the show was a failure, I would argue that, if we measure success by more unconventional means, Otaku no Video was far more successful than it's usually given credit, both at home and abroad. And to understand what I'm talking about, I want to start by discussing Otaku no Video's storied history in the United States. The name Gainax has always carried a certain degree of prestige among American anime fans. In the early 80s, bootleg copies of the Daikon openings made their way to certain clubs in the US, where they transfixed all who watched them. The Wings of Oniamis, as you'll recall, actually premiered in the US. It may have been in the form of the atrocious StarQuest dub, but the premiere undoubtedly helped raise both the movie's and the studio's profile in the country. This would only grow larger when a fan sub version of the movie began to circulate courtesy of Neil Nadelman, who would eventually go on to provide its official English translation. The foundation of the American anime industry can be dated to February 1st, 1990, as this was the day when US renditions released the first legally subtitled anime VHS tape for purchase in the American market. That first VHS release was the first two episodes of Gunbuster. As for Nadia, though the show would not be legally available until a number of years later, Fan translations of episode scripts were widely circulated among clubs and the internet while it was on the air in Japan. The argument can be made that, by 1991, Gainax was perhaps the most well-known studio among American anime fans. Their presence at AnimeCon 91 must have been a huge selling point for the convention, and little did any of those fans know that this presence would continue the tradition of the studio's works being inseverably tied to the history of American fandom itself. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Otaku no Video had its world premiere at 2.30 a.m. on Sunday, September 1st, 1991, to a small crowd at one of AnimeCon 91's video rooms. The show made an immediate impression. The first English-language review, arguably the first review anywhere in the world, was written by Noel Gamboa on Rec.Artstartanime on September 6th, less than a week after the con's close and still several weeks before its release in Japan. The review was laudatory, with many fans expressing their desire to check it out whenever possible. You can see the impact Gamboa's post had on fandom at large by examining RAA's archive posts in the aggregate. Before September 6th, the word otaku was used just a single time, and that single time doesn't even really count as the post was referencing a Japanese actor named Ken Otaku. But after September 6th, otaku appears in thousands and thousands of posts. Most of these initial posts are, admittedly, other fans discussing Otaku no Video itself, though. 
early fandom was mostly positive, with complaints mainly being directed towards the pacing, and especially towards the live-action interviews. There was a small debate concerning whether or not these interviews would paint the fans in a negative light, although this mainly seems to have stemmed from these early fans not realizing the interviews were staged. Once their proper context was established, the debate pretty much died down. The word otaku continued to be mainly used to refer to otaku no video for several months, but slowly, more and more fans began using it to refer to other fans. This all came to a head in a May 1992 post by Steve Pearl and Enrique Conti called the Anime Frequently Asked Questions list. Though the list had been posted before, this edition was updated to include a definition of the word otaku. It provides an honestly impressively thorough definition, taking into account its origins as an archaic pronoun and moving on to mention its negative connotations in Japan, though it admittedly doesn't go into too much detail there. The end of the post, however, is what I find the most interesting. Quote, On the net, otaku is usually referred to a big fan of anime and or manga. For example, I'm an otaku, smiley face, unquote. This is a huge deal. For what seems like the first time, the word otaku is used simply to refer to a fan of anime and manga, completely divorced of its negative cultural baggage associated with its use in Japan. This definition would ultimately end up winning out. Even today, if an American fan says they're an otaku, it usually just means they're an anime fan. A number of Japanese guests to American anime conventions have noticed this quirk of American fan culture where fans are proud to call themselves otaku. It's an interesting example of how language evolves, especially when put through the filter of cultural translation. Otaku no video's continued proliferation in American fandom at around the same time would only further spread this new definition of otaku. In the spring of 1992, a fan subbing outfit called Operation X released the first English translated edition of otaku no video in the United States. 1993 would see pioneering anime licensor Anime Ego release an official translation, bringing it to the attention of even more fans. The show remains in Anime Ego's catalog to this day, 30 years after its initial release, and is considered essential viewing for anyone who's even remotely interested in anime. To me, Otaku no Video released in the US at exactly the right time. Though undoubtedly smaller than that of today, the fans of the early 90s had an unquenchable zeal. They cataloged whatever information on anime they could find, they created fanzines that rivaled that of professional publications, and they were starting to organize conventions that dwarfed anything that had come before. Seeing Otaku no Video must have given these early fans an enormous sense of pride and validation, and given them the drive to continue building this fandom infrastructure. I would never go as far as to claim that Otaku no Video is directly responsible for this, correlation not equaling causation and all, but it is interesting to note that the initial explosion of anime conventions in the United States occurred at around 1994 and 1995, right after Otaku no Video's official release. From basically just Anime Expo, AnimeCon 91 successor, and Project Akon, 1994 and 1995 saw the beginnings of a number of conventions that would go on to become some of the biggest in the world. Fanime, Katsukon, Anime Weekend Atlanta, and most importantly, Otakon, whose full name is actually the Convention of Otaku Generation, which is a direct reference to Otaku no Video's full title, The Graffiti of Otaku Generation. To this day, Otaku no Video is still the first and last thing Otakon plays in its video rooms. American fans couldn't take over the industry in Japan, like Tanaka wanted, but what they could do was establish a healthy industry at home, and on that front, they more than succeeded. I've always been so fascinated by the history of American anime fandom, especially its early history, because it's such a vivid example of how sheer passion and drive, or perhaps I should say hard work and guts, managed to create an entire industry from nothing. In a matter of decades, what started out as a group of tiny clubs scattered over thousands of miles would become an industry that's now worth billions of dollars, a Hollywood film industry that's repeatedly pumped millions of dollars into cute attempts to translate the medium into live action, and a convention landscape such that regardless of what corner of the country you live in, there's probably at least one convention within a reasonable distance of you. Again, I'm not arguing that Otaku no Video is the reason why American anime fandom exists in its current state, but I do sincerely believe that the zeal embodied in this show must have made an impression on those fandom pioneers who built it up to what we see today. This non-tangible impact is what I believe Otaku no Video's legacy should be, both in America and in Japan as well. Though it may not have set the world on fire when it came out in 1991, its description of a future dominated by otaku did, in a way, prove to be an accurate one, 
and though Otaku no Video may not have helped to cause it, Gainax's later work certainly did. The runaway mainstream success of Neon Genesis Evangelion is what many believe is the beginning of the public perception of Otaku transforming into something more positive. Again, I would argue that Otaku have never entirely been able to shed the stigma caused by the Miyazaki murders, but at the same time, I would also go as far as to suggest that the insane successes portrayed in Otaku no Video's second episode aren't as far removed from reality as they might seem. Consider. Though I don't think an anime film has ever been premiered to a sold-out crowd at the Tokyo Dome, I'd argue that something even more insane happened in real life. In 2020, the Demon Slayer Mugen Train movie went on to become not only the highest grossing Japanese film of the year, but the highest grossing film of the year worldwide, something that has never happened before. Gainax may not have held high-level talks with Gorbachev, but again, I would argue that the whole notion of cool Japan, wherein Japan's influence is recognized in soft power cultural exports like anime, manga, and video games, has contributed greatly to its modern political standing, both abroad and at home. Former Prime Minister Taro Aso, for instance, used his otaku credibility as part of his political image. Though we can rightly question his taste for being a fan of Rosen Maiden, the notion that otaku is now an acknowledged political demographic in Japan would have been unheard of in the early 90s. And keep in mind, Aso may have only been Prime Minister for about a year, as is per usual in Japan, but he went on to become the Finance Minister for nearly a decade and is currently the Vice President of the ruling political party, the LDP. He's one of the most powerful people in Japan, and he's an avowed fan of Golgo 13. That's just wild. And what about Otaku Land? There may not be a giant amusement park to rival Tokyo Disneyland, but you know what there is instead? Entire neighborhoods of cities, Akihabara, Denden Town, etc., that cater to any and every otaku interest under the sun. Is that not kind of the same thing? And sure, there may not be a giant conglomeration of the SDF-1 and the Nautilus in the middle of Akihabara, but even then, all you have to do is hop on the Keihin Tohoku line to Yokohama and you'll find a 1 to 1 scale RX-78 Gundam. That to me is Otaku no Video's Japanese legacy. A legacy that can't be measured in awards won or copies sold, but instead by the sheer accuracy of its vision. In the 21st century, the idea of modern Japanese culture simply cannot be severed from the idea of otaku. And in 1991, only the men and women of Gainax had the clarity to understand that this vision would be the case. Hiroyuki Yamaga's attempt to craft a sequel to The Wings of Oniamis encounters one crippling setback after another. Meanwhile, the most successful Gainax work to date takes the world by storm and leads to another era of turbulence for the studio. With the 21st century looming on the horizon, how will Gainax face this uncertain future? 
Find out in the final exciting episode of the history of Gainax, Uru in Blue, the decline of Studio Gainax. Savisu, Savisu!